So if someone visualizes a product in their space, they're five times more likely to make that purchase than if they did not look at a visualized or a visualized product. Welcome to the Smarter Building Materials Marketing Podcast, helping you find better ways to grow leads, sales, and outperform your competition. All right, everyone. Welcome to another episode of Smarter Building Materials Marketing, where we believe your online presence should be your best salesperson. We are really excited because we have a technology company in the house, which as building materials marketers, we don't often get to say. So I'm really excited to welcome Josh Ruff. He is the VP of revenue for Roomvo, which is a very cool visualization tool. But Josh, don't let me give too much away. First of all, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. Super excited to be here. We're excited too. Can I get you to give everyone just a 30,000 foot view of who you are and what Roombo is and what Roombo does before we dive in? Absolutely. So um, I've spent my last 10 years of my career working in technology and startups from uh, food delivery, the food delivery space, think of Uber Eats and those types of companies. And so I've primarily been brought into companies to help scale and set them up for, for long-term success. And um, at Roomvo, high level, we're a, a visualizer company, as you mentioned. And so what we essentially do is allow a consumer to take a photo of their space whether it be living room, kitchen, whatever it might be, um, and visualize a manufacturer's product in that space. And so we do soft surface, hard surface. So think flooring, countertops, walls, backsplash, all of the above. And really we think of ourselves as a, as a sales tool and, and, and enable a consumer to, to take some type of purchase based on seeing a product in their home. So you were in the technology space and you were like, you know what I need to do if I really want to have a future in technology, I need to get into building materials. That's exactly it. You nailed it. <laughs> but I mean, to summarize it quite, quite I, uh, I mentioned I was in the food delivery space and I happened to meet the CEO and um, I would say three or four years ago. And as a result of the pandemic, um, I actually was in corporate food delivery, funny enough. And so we, I worked for a company that did uh, food delivery for Shopify and Twitter and all of the major technology companies. And um, the pandemic came and food ordering at businesses kind of disappeared. And uh, I had met the, the founder, Pavel, here um, in my, in my uh, previous role. And he asked if I was interested in uh, another technology company outside of food. And I said, hey, you know what? I, I just love technology. I love building products and companies. I love working with great people. And so that brought me to the building material space. And here I am. We do have good people. That I am sure of. And we are, we are ripe for technology adoption. So Josh, we talk to manufacturers all the time about visualizers or how to help, especially end consumers, conceptualize their products. Because we know specifically end consumers, homeowners, they have a really hard time understanding what a one by one inch swatch, especially on like a computer screen, looks like when it's at scale on their wall, on their floor, et cetera. So can you share any actual information to help back up the thing that I tell people all the time? Like, do you have data to tell talk about what's the conversion rate of sales likelihood from a visualizer versus just like regular old website? Great question. So what we typically see is about a five time conversion. So if someone visualizes a product in their space, they're five times more likely to make that purchase than if they did not look at a visualized or a visualized product. A um, couple other interesting data points. I think a lot of people are probably familiar with visualizing and there are two different scenarios. There's one where you see a preset room scene where there is, you know, this great inspirational room. You can change products. Um, in those environments, we typically see someone look at four to six products on average in one of those preset room scenes. What we do is we do the preset room scenes, but we also, as I mentioned, allow someone to take a photo of their own room. So we see about 80% of users will actually upload a photo of their own room versus looking at those preset room scenes. And we will see a user actually look at 16 to 20 products in a photo in their own space versus a preset room scene. So we are really, really, really driving engagement uh, when consumers do interact with a photo in their own space. And the end result is, like you said, what is this product actually going to look like in my space? And our whole methodology is how quickly can we allow a customer? Let's make it as simple as possible, as user friendly as possible to say, hey, you know what? I know what this is going to look like. I'm going to buy this product. I'm going to order a sample or whatever it might be. So if I'm a salesperson listening, and we know that we have lots of salespeople who listen, you've kind of like taken a lot of my magic and put it into technology at this point, right? Because we are a very consultative space, just building materials in general. 
I want to have that conversation. You know, I'm hearing all of the things that I know they're going to say. They they need our opinions. They need to know about maybe it's the environment. Maybe it's, you know, um, high humidity or it's like high thaw to freeze cycles, anything like that. How how would you answer those types of questions when it comes to pushing this information digitally? So great question. So I think there's, and, and this might be a long-winded answer here, but I think there's, there's, that's okay. It was a long-winded ways. question. So that's, true. <laughs> <laughs> there's, there's two ways we think about um, visualization and how a consumer can use it. Um, we use the uh, car dealership methodology as a great example. If I'm going to buy a car, I probably go to the toyota.com website or the manufacturer's website to look at product information. That's where I'm going to find, you know, most up-to-date products. I'm not actually buying my car there. I'm actually probably going to Josh's local Toyota dealership to buy my car. And so what we've done is we've, we've got a visualizer that sits on a manufacturer's website and that's great. I can go to, I'm going to share with a customer here, daltile.com, and I can go look at their products and visualize them on their website but I can't transact there. I have to go into a local retailer where I'm gonna purchase that product. And so what we've actually done is extended our visualization service to the retail location. And so as a retailer, I can also add a visualizer to my website and I can select that products I carry, which leads me to the next piece, which post pandemic, we've actually really focused on the in-store experience because like you said, Visualizer on the website's great, but I'm actually interacting with a person when I go into a showroom in most instances. So what we've done is found a way to get the visualizer in the store and we're investing in things like QR codes where I can QR, I can scan this QR code of a product and see what it looks like in my space in the showroom. And now what we're also able to do is work with the RSAs and train them to how they can use Roomvo as a sales tool. So Take it, tell a customer, bring a photo of your space when you come into the showroom. And now as an RSA, I can actually interact with that customer and show them different products and what it's going to look like in their home. And so what we're seeing is huge adoption from the individual salesperson because we're making it easier for a customer to make a purchase. They don't have to go home with that sample now to see what the product looks like in our space. So we are really seeing sales cycles expedited quite exponentially. And we're seeing people able to actually sell for much bigger ticket prices because they're able to show and visualize higher range products and things like that. And so we're actually working really closely with the RSA and providing them a tool that's actually making them a lot more successful in their jobs. Who do you think in our space is the most difficult when it comes to technology adoption? Where do you have to have the hardest conversations? It honestly really, really depends. Um, I think there has historically been... um, a bit of a challenge where manufacturers want customers to go to their website. Um, And so visualizers have lived on a manufacturer's site and the challenge there is a retailer doesn't want to send a customer to a manufacturer's website because there's a dealer locator there, they can find local competition. So you've kind of had different conversations at different levels where when you're talking to a manufacturer, the conversations can be difficult because you, you know, you know that the retailer wants the customer on their site. And the manufacturer spends a lot of money on marketing on their site and they want the customer to go to their site. So they're, I don't want to say anyone's more difficult, but they're just different conversations where when you're the manufacturer, you're trying to sell them on, Hey, the retailer wants to visualize products in their, on their own website. And if you're talking to a retailer, it's, you're talking about, Hey, how can I get adoption in showroom? And I think that's where it becomes challenging because you've got a bunch of people you need to train. So I would say it's, there's not more difficult conversations anywhere. I would say they're just very different. And I would say the appetite for adopting technology is a little bit different depending on where you are. And that comes from resources from not only financial, but just people, right? Like I, it's, if I'm an individual retailer, I don't necessarily have someone, an IT person that can run my systems for me and implement things like that. So I think it's just different um, depending on the audience and who you're talking to. Even now to the installer, um, we see installers that are using it for, um, you know, installation matter like do do i want this to run for horizontal or how do i want the pattern layout and again they're just different conversations at every stage but i think in general it's more education as well it's i would say they're difficult conversations a lot more leading with education about what's out there and educating of what the possibilities are versus hey we just don't want to do this it is much very much an educational exercise so you mentioned this all which all makes sense manufacturers want to have any type of visualization about their products on their site retailers whether it's like showrooms or big box or distribution, if they have the capabilities and it's a product that they stock, they want the visualization on their site. 
what do you think customers want? What's easiest for the customer? Whether it's like installers, end users, architects, what do they want? So the end consumer wants what's the easiest to use, um, where they can visualize the most amount of products. Um, They want simplicity and they want to make an easy decision. And so if I work this up through the chain here from retailer to manufacturer, um, there's implications in a few places here. Um, If you're a manufacturer, you don't want the retailer probably to visualize other manufacturers' products. You probably only want them to visualize your own product. But when I get to the retail level, what happens is I sell lots of manufacturers' products. Adoption becomes very low because if you're a retailer, hey, and I have a customer that comes in, I don't want to tell them I can only I can only visualize this manufacturer's products. I can't visualize this. So it all ties down to what is going to be the best customer experience, like you said, and it's ease of use, it's simplicity, um, and it's finding everything in one location. And so when we first built Roomvo, on a retailer's website, they could only select one manufacturer's products. And what happened is adoption was very low because if you're a, an RSA in the store and a customer says, I want to visualize this product, it's like, hey, I can't do that. It becomes a really bad customer experience. And then what happens at the retail associate level is they're not going to want to use the tool anymore because it's giving them a bad experience with their customers. So we evolved to now Roomvo on a retailer's website, they can actually select multiple manufacturers' products. And so now the consumer can visualize a product catalog from a bunch of different manufacturers. And then that leads into the next piece of, I probably want to visualize more than flooring. If I'm doing my house, I probably want to visualize the walls and I probably want to visualize my backsplash. And so then the exact same process happens where the consumer probably doesn't want to go to a visualizer for floors and another one for walls, another one for backsplash. And so it's really building tool, you know, making our tool easy for the consumer where they can visualize more products. And then what happens is everyone wants to go to where the consumer is, right? So if there's more consumers using the tool, every manufacturer want to play in plays into that space. And so you end up creating this flywheel where it's kind of a win-win for everybody. The easier you can make it to use for consumers, the more products you can put in there, the more you're going to have consumer use and the more value there is for everyone to have some type of product or some type of interaction with the tool. It's not a secret. Consumers today, and I use the the term consumer as a general term for anybody that buys anything. So that includes, you know, commercial installers, right? That's literally everyone in our channel. Consumers today, we are visual creatures. The internet and and Netflix, they've ruined us. We're ruined for life. It is what it is. A lot of feedback that we hear is very few, when you think about it, very few materials in the built environment are actually highly visually impactful, right? So you mentioned surfaces, and those are all like finished materials or like the finished surfaces, which totally makes sense. Do you have any thoughts or recommendations for manufacturers who have products that are not visible when a when a project is complete about how they could leverage vis- visualization? I think as humans, we're just inherently visual. And I think people always want to see something. And so I think of um, blueprints or CAD drawings, like there is some visual component at every step along the building process, right? And so I think anything that you can visualize that will assist in the decision-making process. Cause one way or another, there is always going to be a visual component to that decision. I'm like, how are my cables laid out in my place? That gets visualized at some p- component, right? Like somewhere someone draws a building plan that puts those in there. Maybe it's not the visualization quality and how good that product looks more. It's like, Hey, I want to actually see how this looks amongst other things for maybe it's spacing and maybe it's, you know, measurement and all those types of things, I think there is a place for it. But the driving factor is not the visual of what does this look like? It's more of maybe from an organizational standpoint or how much material I need or something like that. Visuals do play a part in that decision at some point along the way. Yeah, I think you actually hit on it exactly where, because you went to the exact right place where if it's if it's a finished environment, that's you're really comparing visuals for aesthetics, right? Do I want light color flooring, dark color flooring, high striation in my marble countertops or solid coloring or something like that? But if you're talking about non-visuals, what are the things that I want to compare? Is it organization? Like I'm probably not going to swap in and out insulation materials, right? I don't really care 
what the visual is, but what's the impact? Does it impact the depth of the wall? Does it impact the type of material that can go on the outside, on the inside? Does it impact plumbing? Does it impact all of those other things? And how does it lay out organizationally? It's also like this secret to marketing in a sense where if you do a thing, even if it's exactly like everybody else's, but you just make it easier for me to understand, and that and me, including the pro who's done it a bajillion times, if it's easier to understand, I just feel more confident about it. So I think that's like a dead on answer, Josh. Way and, to go. Uh, that, was, that was a test about whether or not you're thank one of you. us. You passed. Thank you. I did. I did. I'm not just a technology person. Yeah, I, you're I, I not just a technology person. <laughs> yeah, um, that's the exactly other thing right. I think, too, is when I think about visualization, um, I shouldn't say I should say we when we think about it, there is a lot more to it than just a photo, right? Like what data can I take from that photo is kind of the next step where it's like, can I take measurements from that photo? And mm -hmm. when I think about today, we do use sizing if I have different plank width, for example, like we adjust to scale. And so you can think of a photo as a data point, like what data can I take from this to help me with making a decision? So that's another whole component there that is sometimes overlooked that there is a lot of data that you can take from a photo. And maybe it's not, you know, if you're thinking about building plans, you're not taking a photo of existing, but there is a lot of data that can come from the visual component as well. I totally agree. And I think that's a really important piece of we're not just pushing people to get online because like that's cool, but like you can get data of where do people see your project come in? Are you the first? Are you the last? Are you just like this nice little upgrade or are you part of a huge renovation project? And that's where, and that, I mean, that impacts product roadmap, that impacts product innovation. It's a huge, huge data point. As a self-proclaimed data nerd, anything that sticks out in your mind that you would want to share, you're like that you've seen your customers be able to grab and implement from a data standpoint? We have obviously access to a ton of data. And I would say what's, this is very new for a lot of companies. I would say visual, visualization is one, but actually becoming very data driven. And so we think of the pandemic and accelerating businesses online. I would say the conversations I was having two and a half years ago when I first started in the industry compared to now are very different. And so things like, you know, conversion tracking, things like, you know, my customer acquisition costs, like just general conversations around data and marketing automation and visualization um, were not as prevalent as they are today. And so I would say I, overall, the bigger shift is more customers are talking about being data driven and they want to actually understand more about their customer. How that ties into us is quite unique because we obviously know what products are being looked at where and what are your most popular colors in this region and what are people buying here we have a ton of consumer insight and so we're seeing of course a lot of manufacturers want to know hey you know across my entire network what is our most popular SKUs that are being visualized and so we have an abundance of consumer data now that also we sometimes overlook it's it really can help predicting trends and you know what's popular and what's not and, and really driving businesses it just it kind of comes back to data right it's like how can we get more data and it's not just you know the visual component but hey what about the over overarching data of all of kind of our products which is a whole other uh conversation um in itself because you do see very different trends if you're talking you know the, the southern united states and we have a pretty big presence in europe the products people are looking at are very very different and you can see it even on a regional level so it's pretty interesting to see so if you could peel back the curtain josh what predictions do you have for the, I would say, demand for really that like in-store but online combined shopping experience in our industry over the next three to five years? Having tighter integrations between visualizing a product and purchasing it, right? So I think we, we've talked about the acceleration of digital, um, but what is the next step for that? You know, you don't see a whole lot of e-commerce in general. Hey, you know what? I found a product I like, and I think a lot of it is driven by people still want to see a physical sample. Um, and we are still, as you know, millennials become, you know, and we start to see a transition in the workforce and who home buyers are, um, you'll start to see more people buying online and looking for tools that can help them make that online purchase. And so when I think about that, I think of and we, we debate this a lot, like, will, will the physical sample ever go away? Um, and so that is very at the, for, or at the forefront of our conversations. And I, I do think there is a world where 
someone visualizes a product in their space, they are able to measure that space at the same time and then actually transact and purchase. And I think that's kind of where we would love to see things go. And we're hearing about it at the retail level. Um, I would, you know, I'm not going to wave my magic wand and say that's the reality here. I think there's a long way to go. But if you look at other industries and how they have progressed, I think it is a slow progression where it's purchase in store or purchase online, pick up in store is kind of the next transition to eventually being, you know, almost a full e-commerce solution. And I do, uh, there's people that are probably going to be, you know, screaming at me like physical samples will never go away. Oh, we're, but, we're about uh, to get emails. I can just feel it. <laughs> <laughs> but we, we are, we are seeing a lot of people ask us about tools that can help in the decision-making process. It is such a costly endeavor samples. Um, a lot of them just get sent, they disappear. And so, is there a way we can actually have an impact? And I think that is a win-win. If 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 we can find a solution where physical sampling can disappear and people can still purchase, um, and it doesn't have an impact on you know the orders that are coming in, I think that's a win-win for everybody. I think everyone would love to get away from the world of physical samples. Um, How would you solve for basically just screen resolution or whatever the right terminology is? Like colors on screens are not the same as colors in real life. That's like this. That's the most common denominator of pushback on samples. There's a bajillion other reasons why physical samples are important, but how would you solve for that? A hundred percent. So one is we have built a tool where um, we call it virtual samples, where you can actually view a product in a 3d space. Um, But what we've done to that is we are actually able to put different lighting patterns on it. So we can say, what does this product look like in the dark? What does this product look like under a warm light, under a light, uh, under a, under a a cool light. And so we do that based on true Calvin's. And again, you still, we still live in a world where everyone's screen is different. Screen resolution is very different and that's going to be a tough problem to solve. But I will say that we have, we have actually had real world impact for our customers on reducing returns because of that reason. Exactly. Where it's like, Hey, I bought this product. I have a better and I think the conversation here is not, will we get away from it, but are we slowly improving so that doesn't need to happen? And we are seeing that today. We are seeing customers buying with more confidence and returning less products because we're getting, we're moving in the right direction to be able to produce a digital representation of what a product looks like. And I think we are progressing towards that. Do I think it's going to happen in the next couple of years? I don't know, but there are so much technology advancements around us and in terms of screens, in terms of everything. And so you don't just have to think about the technology that we can build, but what other technologies in tandem and industries not like ours in terms of screen technology, in terms of other things that will also be advancing at the same rate. And you hope at some point that, you know, you're able to see a world where, hey, I know exactly what this is going to look like in our space. And that is the question everyone asks is, hey, I want to touch and feel this thing. And Mm -hmm. there does come a point where every industry comes to that, you know, stage where it's, you know, you, there's probably countless products you can think of that you're like groceries are a great example pre pandemic. No one yep. ordered groceries online. Um, I know I, I worked in the space. Um, it's one of those things where once you purchase something and it's an experience that you didn't think you would enjoy, or you were like, Hey, I don't think I would be able to do that. It only takes once. And a lot of people probably order groceries. Yeah. <laughs> and, and, and that's the thing. Once someone orders, groceries one time, it's like, oh, hey, that was so easy. And so I think it's getting to that point where there's some early adopters that can see success. Um, and that's really going to drive kind of what happens next. And for us, it's if our if customers and manufacturers and everyone wants to move to a world where sampling is kind of obsolete, and we can do things digitally, like 100%, we kind of move where the market goes. And so we're you know, I'm not sitting here with a crystal ball saying, hey, we're going to build this and hope people do it. We very yeah. much develop based on where we think the consumer is going to go and, and where we think we can have, you know, we can we get feedback from a manufacturer and there's like, hey, there's a problem we want to be able to solve. And it's like, let's have some open dialogue. Let's see if we can help you with technology solve this problem. And for sure, sampling is one of those things that I think everyone would love to see. Um, go away. It's a huge cost. It's a huge undertaking operationally shipping costs. Like it is a huge cost. And um, yeah, I mean, it would be great if, but yeah. Or to solve for samples being intentional and purposeful versus just like mass production, like five of this 
product in these variation of colors for manufacturer A and the same in B and the same in C for just like minute comparisons versus what if you knew your samples had a 33% conversion rate, right? You have a one in three chance of converting if someone gets a sample. This is obviously not real time, but if you were in a place where you were much farther down the line by the time you choose a sample, that makes that starts to be make a lot more sense versus just this mass volume that can happen. That's exactly. really interesting. Yeah. Yeah. And so what we see happening now with a few manufacturers that we work with today is they are QR coding a sample that they send to a customer. And so um, if you receive that sample, you can scan that QR code. It will automatically prompt you to take a photo of your space. I can take a picture and it will automatically take that product and place it on the respective surface. So say I ordered a flooring sample, scan the QR code, I can take a picture of my living room floor and then within seconds, it is gonna put that product on my floor. And so that is kind of the intermediary step where, hey, how can I improve samples? Maybe we don't get away from sampling, but how can I improve? How can I improve it? Yep. A, get some real time tracking in this. Are people actually scanning the QR code? What are people doing when we get this sample? Uh, And how can we kind of improve the different conversion steps along the way? So that's also things we're thinking about too, right? So it's how do we make these samples interactive and and a little bit more than just, hey, I'm going to dump a plain sample. Like let's take it a step further to really help you make the decision of that sample. I actually love that because we we talk a lot about samples and we were working with the roofing manufacturer last year and they were working on a new set of samples, but they have a very just unique coloring system for their roofing tiles. And the problem is when you see it really close up, it kind of looks like a mess. It's like a, it's like a, who's the pointillism artist? Is that Matisse? Picasso? Who am I talking about? I don't know. Whatever. Picasso, I Imagine know, like I a know pointillism. <laughs> but yeah, yeah. Picasso is always a mess. Pointillism, like you like stand a hundred feet away from it. And you're like, oh, that's beautiful. And then you get up close and you're like, wait a minute, what's happening? Like that's how their roofing samples are, right? So you look at it really up close and you're like, mm, this looks terrible. But when it's up on a roof, you know, 50 feet in the air and you're standing on the corner of it to get a whole home image, it's gorgeous. So it solves for those types of things also where yeah. you're not seeing it, like really seeing what it would look like. Um, Because if you're not an architect and you don't know that that's what that would be like. Anyway, another conversation for another time, but very cool. Very cool application. All right, Josh, you're in the technology space. You're in visualization space. If you could give manufacturers one piece of advice on how to make their marketing more impactful in the new year, what would you tell them? Oh, geez. I would say um, you're going to have to edit this one. Other than Beyond Roombo. (laughs) (laughs) I I would say um, in general, I think it's been a pretty static industry in terms of how products are marketed. And so I think uh, in general, I think there's a lot of different, unique, compelling ways that you can capture your audience outside of the traditional methods, right? So I think you need to think outside of the box. I think a lot of people do the same thing because it's always worked. But I, I think people are a little bit apprehensive to try something different. And so, um, you know, outside of Roombo, I, I do think there's a ton of opportunity there. It's not always, you know, sam- the same old samples with like the sample images or inspiration images on the back. Like there are some pretty unique ways that you can engage customers. And I think understanding the audience, right, understanding who is your buyer now, um, what are they interested in knowing? Um, are they interested in product specs? Are they more interested in look and feel? And I think understanding the consumer and then working backwards because I think the industry has changed so much and the way people are actually purchasing products is drastically different than it was even two to three years ago. So I think it's it's understanding, hey, where do I meet my customer? Who is my new consumer and what's important to them? And then I think being a little bit creative I, and you might wanna edit this out, but it's it's a dry, in, it's, it's an old school industry, right? I think creativity and having a, a cool little spin on things can sometimes go a long way outside of the standard samples and those types of things. So, but it's true, right? It's like very old school. It's like everyone does the same thing. Uh, all the company, no one's really trying to differentiate themselves from a marketing standpoint. I think there is a huge opportunity to do that. And having come from a pretty unique industry, we, um, we did some really crafty kind of scrappy marketing stuff that worked really well. And I think it's, People are worried a little bit about it's an old industry and there's a lot of like, you know, 
things that are just done the way they are. And some people are a little bit apprehensive to kind of ruffle some feathers, but I do think it does go a long way. And I think people recognize it, right? You got to separate yourselves and find a way to differentiate yourselves. And sometimes creativity is the easiest way to do it. Yeah. I love, I love that creativity is the way, best way to differentiate yourself. You actually started the art, this conversation with something that we are starting to really try to be a regular drumbeat of what we say, which is we're about five to 10 years out from millennials being the predominant generation in the building materials industry, it really in every industry. But that means that our generation is doesn't just expect a digital experience from the brands that we purchase, specify, install. We demand it. And will flip for a brand from one that has only traditional to one that services us completely from a digital experience. I mean, those are longstanding millennial generation facts. And that is going to be a very fun moment in our industry because it's going to go from we just do what we've always done because we've always done it and everybody always does it to like, oh, man, we've got to do something different because everybody is going to this other brand that does things differently already. Well, Josh, thank you so much for your time. If any of our listeners want to reach out to you, ask questions, connect, what's the best way for them to get in touch with you? Best is email. So J Ruff, R-U-F is in Frank, F is in Frank at rumbo.com. That's the best way to reach me, but feel free to shoot me a LinkedIn or, or anything like that as well. Awesome. Well, thank you so much. And if you like this content and want to hear more of it, head to venvio.com slash podcast to subscribe. Until next time, we'll see you all later. Thanks, everybody. 